All right, it is three o'clock. I'm gonna get started here. Um, is this bothering people on this side because my monitor may be blocking a part of the screen? No, it's okay. All right, okay. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to get started today. Um, let me just kind of go back to where we were. Oops, okay, wrong screen. There you go. You find my cursor. There you go. So where we left off last week, um, that has been a not not a whole week, you know, but last Wednesday. So last time we were talking about quantifiers. So we were on this particular topic and we finished it. Okay, um, I also remembered that I you know started on big operators, uh, and we are pretty much done with the big operators as well. So what we'll do today is to start with set notations using quantifiers. The homework assignment is already released, so from your perspective, you know, you won't see the all the other stuff, but this set notation uh, homework assignment is released. So I'm just going to click it so that you can take a quick look at it. The most important part is you only have one attempt. Okay, you have almost the entire week to do it, but you only want to submit once. Okay, especially for those of you who are also taking CISP 310 from me, because the labs are kind of like you can do it as many times as you want, and it counts only, only the highest score. This one only counts once. Okay, so you want to make sure you can open as soon as possible. You can even open it now. But don't submit until you are absolutely sure that that's the answer that you want to turn in. Yes. So we close it after we open. You can close it. You can you can even close the browser. You close the browser, starting up on another computer. It will keep your progress. Just don't submit because once you submit, it will count only that grade, and you cannot make another attempt. Okay, so you only got one attempt at this. But you can stay open for the whole week, okay? You know, just you know, turn it in and submit, you know, at the very last moment. That, you know, that works too. <clears throat> All right, so with that said, we're going to switch back to the notations. So this time we are talking about set notations, but using quantifiers. I do want to make sure that everybody know that, you know, I'm starting from, I guess, last week. Um, I'm always including an AI-generated questions, you know, section. So that way, you guys have a chance to practice all the you know, concepts. So in this case, you know, it has. You know, I usually only ask for ten questions. Does anyone want me to ask for like a lot more? No. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure that you know it's not like some people want to go for like you know a hundred or something like that. Um, <clears throat> starting with the even newer uh, modules, I will show you. Okay, so starting with uh, the even newer modules, especially the one on functions, which is, which is, we might be able to get to this today, hopefully, but we may not. But starting with this one, um, I even include the uh, chat GPT prompt. So someone who is interested in doing this but want more practice questions can just adjust the prompt and ask for more questions. So there's always that possibility. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether this is helpful or not, but I think it's going to be helpful. You know, it's just a technique of using um, AI or LLM to be specific, you know, to help you study you know, all kinds of you know, subjects. All right, so getting back to uh, the notations in using quantifiers, we are just going to start here. <clears throat> Equality, you know, if you have two different sets, you know, X and Y, how do you know they are the same or not? So using the quantifiers, you know, we can use the really kind of clumsy way to say it, or we can use the more concise way to say it. The more concise way to say it is x is a set, y is a set, they equal to each other, which and only if for everything in the entire universe, if that thing is an element of x, if and only if that thing is also an element of y. The key here is you have to use if and only if here, and not just implies or the other way around, be implied by. Are we good so far with this? Kind of makes sense, right? Because a set is a container. It's basically saying whatever is contained here needs to be contained over there. 
and vice versa in order for the two containers to be considered equivalent. Are we good with uh, equivalence? You know, how two sets are the same? Okay, all right, I see a lot of nods. So this one is more of more about membership in a set. So we talked about you know, how to use this notation to indicate you know, the membership in the set E. So the best, the other way to express this is to say for everything in the entire universe, <clears throat> X is an element of E if and only if P of X is true. It means exactly the same thing as that one. Without the quantifiers, this is, how, this is how we used to express it, but without the quantifier, we don't know whether it is an existential quantifier that is implied or a universal quantifier that is, uh, that is implied. So in this case, I made it very explicit. We are using the universal quantifier. Are we still doing okay so far with the uh, set description? You know, more like membership description of a set. Okay. So the empty set is pretty easy to describe. You know, this is one way to describe it. It is not the case that there exists at least one thing in the entire universe that that thing is an element of S. Okay, because an empty set is empty. It's not supposed to have anything. Nothing in the entire universe should be an element of the set. So in that case, you know, S is an empty set if and only if this is true. All right, intersection and union. For everything in the entire universe, X is X for everything X, okay? For each thing X in the entire universe. X is an element of the intersection between A and B, if and only if X is in A and X is in B. Okay, that's pretty much the same definition that we talked about, except, you know, I put a universal quantifier on the outside. And basically the same thing with the union operator. Um, for everything in the entire universe, X, X is an element of the union between A and B, if and only if A can be found in A, or X, excuse me, if X can be found in A, or X can be found in B. Any questions? All right. So you want to be familiar with the symbols to the point where you can read, you can look at an expression and be able to, you know, kind of, pronounce it in an English sentence, okay? So that's the, the proficiency that you probably want to shoot for. And the best way to practice it is to practice it with another person, okay? You just pick a random, you know, universally quantified statement or a existentially quantified statement, and then tell the other person what it really means, okay? Uh, the exercises at the end of the module may be helpful too, because you know, some of those are word questions. So Cartesian product is a little funky, okay, because there are actually two universally quantified expressions. The first one is nested for every X in A, for every Y in B, XY is an element of the Cartesian product between A and B. So it seems like this one captures everything that we want to capture, but it really does not, because it doesn't tell us what is not supposed to be in the Cartesian product. I can throw in some extra stuff into you know, X, X, A times B, and this does not stop me from doing that. So that's why it's not enough. That's why we need the other side, which basically says, if you take anything from A, the, from the Cartesian product of A and B, first of all, it has to look like a two-tuple, and second of all, the first item in the two-tuple, X, has to be found in A, and the second item in the two-tuple, Y, has to be found in B. So that is a, it's necessary to have both of these components. Just having this component means, oh, I may be missing something in the Cartesian product. Just having on this side means I can have additional things that really do, do not, additional items that do not belong in the Cartesian product. So only when I have a conjunction here, you're joining these two sides, that I have a precise description of what should be in the Cartesian product between the, uh, the set A and the set B. All right, does everybody understand what I just said? Because I just worked out a lot of things. No questions? 
or not quite what I said? I couldn't get it. You couldn't get it, okay. So if we look at this slide here, does that say that the integer two is not supposed to be in the Cartesian product? In other words, if the integer two, not even the two tuple, okay, was in the Cartesian product, would it make this entire statement false? No, it wouldn't. It would not make this you know, entire thing false. Think about what if A is empty and B is also empty. If A is empty and B is empty, and I say, okay, I, I thought that two is supposed to be in the Cartesian product, would the quantified expression, which goes from here all the way up to here, would that still be true? Yeah, it would still be true. Because it only says what needs to be in the Cartesian product. It doesn't say anything about, oh, everything else should not be in the Cartesian product. That's what the left-hand side of the conjunction is saying. It's only counting things that are supposed to be in, but it doesn't say anything about, what about all of the other stuff, you know, is this supposed to be in that set too? We don't know, it didn't say anything about it. So the, so the left-hand side says what should be in the set, but it didn't say anything about what should not be in the set. The right-hand side, on the other hand, you know, specifies you know, um, for everything that is in the Cartesian product, it has to have these properties. So it excludes things that should not be in the Cartesian product. Yep. Okay, so big picture here, are we trying to describe the set operators using quantifiers? Yep. Okay. Yep. So we are, this is both, uh, it's trying to serve two purposes, or I was trying to ser serve two purposes with this particular module. One is the application of the quantifiers, and the second one is to use this as another opportunity to explain the set operators. Yep. So quick kind of question. Mm -hmm. It feels like we're using the Cartesian product in the definition of the Cartesian product. Um, well, yes and no, because you know, this is really just defining what is A cross B. In other words, A cross B has no particular meaning in this particular context. Yeah. It is defined by this context. Yeah. So A cross B needs to make this entire thing true. So that as a, as from that perspective, I'm defining what is A cross B, which is the Cartesian product of A and B. So that was a that was a good question. I didn't quite explain the context of this you know, entire expression here. Is that okay? And you should you said the right part is the things that should not be in the it it will exclude things like just the integer value of two because you know two is not cannot possibly be in uh, a cross B because it's not even the two tuple. All right. But are we sh so are we good with the actual definition of Cartesian product? What the Cartesian product should have? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Shall we move on, or are there additional questions about this one? <coughs> You're good? Okay. So we now talk about subset. A is a subset of B if and only if, for every E in A, E is also in B. A is a proper subset of B if and only if, A is a subset of B, and there exists one at least one thing in B that is not in A. This negation applies to the entire element of expression. The negation applies to, okay, let me explain that. The negation applies to x is an element of a. Because you cannot take a negation of an element that is not Boolean. <clears throat> but just to make it clear, 
you know, you can put ex put an extra pair of parentheses from here all the way through here. Are we okay so far? So this is just a different way of explaining the same operators that have been explained already. You know, in some cases, it's a clarification. In some other cases, it's just you know, a different, you know, just an exercise of using quantifiers. All right, so do you guys want me to kind of go over some of the questions or some of you might have gone over some of the questions and have something that you want to ask in class? So are there any questions regarding the AI generated question? Or do you guys just want me to pick one to talk about? Oh, the, the, nope. No, these are easier. <laughs> these these are easier, <clears throat> which is uh, which is interesting because it demonstrates that the AI can ask some questions, but it is more on a surface level. The questions that you will see in the homework assignment are a little deeper than that. Pick one. I'll let you guys pick. Mm, I can do that after it's due. <laughs> because that's the whole point, right? The whole point is to have you guys do it, not have me to talk about it and you guys you know, kind of try to understand it. You can come to my office hour if you have any specific question about that. But out of these, you know, does anyone want to choose one that, so, so I can talk about it? Like now. Hmm? Yep. So how would you express the quality of two sets A and B using a single quantifier expression? Uh, so that would be for everything. Oh, okay. For everything in the entire universe, uh, something, that thing is in A if and only if that thing is in B. Okay, so let me let me write it out, okay, because I just said something. It's harder for some people to arbitrarily process it. I'll be one of those people. So I'm going to use, uh, let me see if Joplin is already up. It doesn't look like it. Um, I'm just started. It's no big deal. So give me a second. Let me start up uh, Joplin. <clears throat> there we go. And of course, when it starts, it has to be a little bit too big. There we go. So this is Joplin. You know, it's not new to you guys. I've used it before already. Let me go to CISP 440. Make a new note for today. Today is 2024-0909. And then I can maximize the area. Okay. So uh, to answer the question in the AI generated question, okay, so let me show you the question. The question is right here, how would you express the equality of two sets A and B using a single quantifier expression? Okay, so uh, I guess if people even from this side can read the question itself. Okay, so the way I would do this is to say for For all uh, e, okay. So that means you know, that's this is a single quantifier, okay. There's no nesting whatsoever, and what I need to express here is this thing, uh, left, right arrow, the other thing. In other words, I'm using if and only if, and then what is in one side is going to be e in oops a. And then the, the, uh, the other side is E and B. Um, for those of, for all of you, you can focus on you know, the right hand side because the left hand side is just the uh, markdown format of how I you know, enter the equation. So that would be it. Okay, you know, for everything in the entire universe, that A, that thing E is in A, even only if that thing is also in B. That would be. If this quantified expression is true, that means A and B are the same. So Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah, so that would, the like, well, 
would not work for that question specifically. You have to write it out in like that expanded format. Could you repeat that question? Like, okay, so it's like you just have to set it to an equal like x equal to y or a equal to b. That would not work for this question. A is equal to b. But the question is asking how do you define that the two sets are the same? And oh, so it's asking for like the extended stuff. Hmm? It's asking for like the extended arrow. Yeah, it's asking you to use the quantified expression to express the a and b are the same, given that a and b are known to be sets to begin with. Because if a is a set and b is something else, you know, then you have a tight mismatch anyway, and they cannot be the same. So it has to be given that A and B are already known to be sets. So we are only looking at the membership of the two sets. Yep. Um, <coughs> how does it relate to that thing with when we used um, like implied to filter for only certain things? Like, if, um, like could you write this in that format? Um, yes, because if and only if is really more or less a simplification of a conjunction involving only implication to one side. Okay, let, let me let me uh, specify what I mean by that. Uh, I can use double equal. So double dollar sign means you know we just want the text to be bigger and it's going to be centered um, because you know x. Okay, so I will just. Okay, so I I'm trying to x um, if and only if y is actually defined to be this thing and this thing. The first thing being you know, uh, x right arrow y, and then the second thing is y uh, right arrow x. Because that's one way to look at the definition of if and only if. So if you look at this and you can apply that to the previous expression, so the long spelled out way is you know, for everything, for every E, E is in A implies E is in B, put that whole thing in parentheses, and for E is in B implies E is in A. So it's kind of like applying two filters and one together. Sort of, but you only, but there's actually, yeah, you, you can call it that too. Yep. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Are we are we okay with this entire module, or do you guys want me to go over another of these questions? Yep. Uh, number nine. Number nine. So, what is the statement? E is in E. E being the set, if and only if P of X mean in terms of set notation and quantifiers. Um, so, this is the way we do it before we introduce quantifiers. But the quantifier is implied to be universal. So that means you know, there's, there's supposed to be a, um, put, the, put this entire expression in parentheses, and then outside, there's simply a for all x. So I think that is the answer. Oh, OK. So it means you know, this expression really means the same thing as this expression here. But that does not even involve the use of quantifiers. Because that was introduced, I think, sometime last week. I think last Wednesday we talked about this. You know, how do we express membership in a set when there's an infinite number of members? Is we define a predicate P, so the predicate P is true if and only if that thing, whatever is inside the parentheses, is a member of the set that we intend to define. All right. Mm -hmm. There's a text editor that you must write in. Uh huh. Oh, I just missed it right here. Those two statements are the same. You mean this one and this one? Yeah. No, they are not. This is this is the definition of even only if. That has to do with the how we define the two sets A and B are the same, being the same. So they are not the same. They don't. They don't say the same thing, but I just want to let people know what if and only if means. Can we express if and only if using just implication and the conjunction? The answer is yes, we can. All right. Any other questions about 
the use of quantifiers. It's okay not to have any questions right now because we're going to use it a lot more after this. So, you know, in the future, you know, when you look at an expression and go like, we don't know what that is really trying to say, then we can go ahead and you know, explain those two as we encounter the more difficult applications of quantifiers. All right. Yep. Ah, that is a very good question. Why can't we just put a conjunction here instead of a if and only if? So if you put a conjunction here, <clears throat> then you can have, let me see, then you're looking at the intersection. You you know okay, so if you if you if you put an end here, okay, so we'll, I'll try to think of some concrete cases where that is not going to work. Um, if you put an end here, e is in a and e is in b. So I'm looking for a case where the conjunction is false and just a and b are the same. Oh, the other way. Okay, I can give you. I can give you an example. Where this whole thing is true, but this is not true. Okay, so let me see. Oh, okay, I got an even better answer. If this operator here is an and, this whole thing is going to be false anyway, unless your A is the universe and B is also the universe. Okay. I just said, I just mentioned a sentence where every single word you already understand. But do you understand what the entire sentence means? Let me say that one more time. If I change this, if and only if, to a conjunction, and, okay, then this statement will only be true if A and B are actually referencing the entire universe. For any set that is less than the entire, the entire universe, is not this whole thing is going to be false. Okay, so let's use examples, okay? Because examples are great to illustrate this. So let me, I'm just thinking about you know, where to put the example on the whiteboard or you know, in Joplin. I can do it in Joplin, okay? So we'll do it in Joplin, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so we'll do it in Joplin. So we'll say that in this particular example, A is defined to have the uh, elements of one, two, and three, okay? Don't ask me why, but that's how we want to define it, and so is B. Is that okay? So quite obviously, by the very definition, A and B are the same. So now we want to look at the modified universally quantified expression where the if and only if is turned into a conjunction, and then we'll see why <clears throat> the universally quantified expression is false, okay? So let me ask you this one thing here. Do you think um, this is in the entire universe? Yeah, it is. So if I bind four to E, because you know, I'm just examining that one thing in the entire universe, is four in A the way it is defined here? Nope. How about, you know, is 4 in B? Nope. So that means false and false is false. So that makes the universally quantified expression false, despite the fact that A and B are actually the same. Okay, so the only time you know, what you suggested would actually be true is when A and B are, in fact, the universe itself. Then it would be, it would be fine. Is that okay? All right, cool. Then someone is going to ask, I know some of you are already thinking, but how does if and only if changes that? Easy. Because 4 is not an element of A, right? It's false. 4 is also not an element of B, which is also false. But false if and only if false is true. That's right. So it doesn't mess up the definition of equivalence or equality between sets. Is that okay? Okay. So it is by 
this is a way of studying, okay, is to come up with these ideas and go like, why can't we use this operator? So you know, then you define you know, a relatively simple example and go like, okay, can I show that this operator taking the place of it if and only if it's going to mess it up? All right. So as an exercise, okay, you can write it down as an exercise. Replace this if and only if with just implication on one side, or replace it with disjunction of the or, and see how that's going to mess it up. You go like, hey, these two are not really the same, but it's making this universally quantified expression free. So you can work out those cases. It's by working out those cases that one, you're studying, because, because it forces you to remember the definition of what is the existential quantifier, what is the universal quantifier, what are the operators? What does it mean when we say E is in A and E is in B? It also you know, make you think about you know, how to make an argument. Okay? You know, why is this not working? Can I come up with an example to illustrate that it is not working? So it's in that process that you gain a much better understanding of the material. Is that okay? All right, so I just gave you a very informal homework assignment. You know, you basically evaluate and contemplate your certain cases. So at that point, at this point, we are pretty much done with you know, the notation of a set and the operators and also quantifiers. Do we have any general questions about those particular concepts? It's, sometimes it's hard to come up with questions until you start to see an, the application of those you know, not, uh, notations. So what we'll do is we are going to move on to use those notations so that we can, do, we can define you know, a function as a set. So this is why we are moving on to uh, this particular module, which is called uh, functions as a set. So the first part only talks about tuple, you know, and you know, all the notations you know, cor corresponding to tuples, which we have already talked about when we talked about um, Cartesian product. So I can, I'm going to skip this portion unless somebody wants me to talk about this portion specifically. Okay. I think we can skip it for now. Then we move on to the concept of a function. So the concept of a function is not new. It certainly should not be new to you because your C also has functions, okay? Except in the case of C, or C++, or any practical programming language, um, there are certain things that work you know, to illustrate concepts in math and certain things that really hinder the explanation of concepts. I'll give you one example, int, int. You go like, int is integer. Well, so what is the big deal here? Well, in C and C++, in every implementation of C and C++, there's only a finite number of integers. You go like, well, that's only the case when, you're, you, have, when you have 16 bit integers, but we have 64 bit integers, so it has to be a bazillion or infinite number of integers. That is not the case, okay? The, the, the most negative value you can represent using 64 bit to represent an integer is negative two to the power of 63. Is that a huge number? Yes, it is still finite. The most positive value you can represent using 64 bits is two to the power of 63 minus one. Is that a huge number? Yes. But is it still finite? Yes, so that means if you just add one to the number that I talked about, you can no longer represent that value using a 64-bit integer. So for certain type of math concepts, the implementation of those concepts in a programming language like C or C++ is okay from the practical standpoint, but it's not really the same from the mathematical standpoint. So we, we want to keep and uh, you know, kind of keep that in mind. So let's go back to here. Um, let's say you know this is from the mathematical perspective. You want to define a very simple function. f of x is defined to be 2 times x, where x is an integer. Okay, So 
So f of 2 is 4, f of 3 is 6, f of negative 1 is negative 2, and so on. Okay, so that's a relatively simple concept. I'm, what I'm going with this is I need to now look at this notation here. So this notation means that we are defining, we are describing, or I should not say defining, we're describing function f. x is what we call the domain, and y is what we call the codomain, which is also known as the range in mathematics. You're not, yeah, go ahead. Do you mean x is the domain, y is the codomain? x is the domain, y is the codomain. But the, the codomain is also known as the, the range in mathematics. But in this class, we call it the codomain. So the way it works is for every x, for every element of x, the function f is going to, quote unquote, map it to an element in y. So this notation is only describing what elements are we talking about to map from and potentially, what can we map that uh, map these elements to? It's only talking about the potential. It doesn't give you the actual mapping. It doesn't actually say, oh, this goes over there and this goes over there. It does not say that. It only talks about what are you talking about, okay? You know, what value are we mapping from and what is the space that we can map to? That's basically what this notation is trying to express. X is mapped to Y. I'm not using those terms, you know, onto. Those are kind of, we'll, we'll talk about those when we talk about injection, subjection, and bijection. Yep, because what you're talking about is are specific to certain kinds of functions. At this point, we only want to know what constitutes a function and what is not a function. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So in this case, um, if we define you know, f of x is just 2x, and x is confined to only integers, then we are talking about a function that can be described like this. This funny looking z represents the set of all integers. So this is something that you, if you, this is the first time you see the funny looking z, you might want to jot down some notes so that you can remind yourself that this is representing the set of all integers. But if you have seen this already, this is nothing new, then you know, obviously you don't have to make, uh, make a note of that. So if we are to describe the, um, the mapping, one way we can describe it is F can be seen as a set of two tuples, where each tuple in the set describes where are we mapping from and where are we mapping it to, okay? So that is why you know, this entire module is called you know, functions as a set, because we want to use the concept of a set of two tuples where the first item is coming from the domain and the second item is coming from the codomain to establish a single map from a single value from the domain to a single value in the codomain. So that is the key of what we are talking about here. There are some additional constraints that I have to talk about, but this is the basic idea of how we use a set to represent a function. All right, so I'm gonna pause here and see if there are any questions about what I just talked about so far. No questions, okay. Yep, go ahead. So the f of f, or f equals zero, zero, one, two, is the function f equals 2x as a set? Well, it is. this is a partial example of what is in that set. Well, yeah, the, the mm -hmm. yep, that is correct. But the, the second one is, the, is more of a, a, a better definition. So this notation here says you know, f is a set, because we see the use of the braces, where each element is a two-tuple. And within the two-tuple, we have x and two times x inside the two tuple, and x has to be an integer. So this is a better description of you know, what I want to describe. So let me scroll down a little bit. <clears throat> Say it again. No, it would just be zero comma zero because it can 
because it has to be a two tuple where the first item of the two tuple is coming from the domain, which is the set of all integers. The second item in the two tuple also must be coming from the set of integers. But you cannot have three items in a tuple or four items in a tuple because we're only mapping integer values to integer values. Is that okay? Because what I heard is you, know, you, you were mentioning you know, a tuple that has more than two elements, or did I misinterpret it? Uh, no, no, no. So, so if you have zero and zero running, then the next one's one and two, mm -hmm. the element zero is in the one as well. So there's no restriction of, you know, okay, so the first element is what zero, zero as a two tuple. Um, okay, first of all, there's no such thing as a first element versus the second element right. because nothing in a set, is, a set is not ordered, right? So one element in the set is zero, zero. Uh, another element of the set is one, two. Another one is negative one, negative two, right? Because negative one is also an integer. Yeah, right. So are there, is there another question? Okay, all right. So this notation is the same as this notation here. So basically, you know, okay, they're not exactly the same, but they mean the same thing. For every x in z, for every y in z, okay? So, so at this point, okay, by the time I get to this point here, I only know that x is an integer like three, and y is also an integer like negative five, okay? So just think about that specific case. x is three, y is negative five. And the first thing you guys are thinking is like, but that should not be in the set. It's okay, we, we, we got it handled. Y equals to two X, wait, negative five equals to two times three, that's not right. It's false, right? Okay, remember that, this is false. What about this part here? Uh, three comma negative five is an element of F. I don't think it's supposed to be there. So we have false on this side too which means the if and only if it's going to be true, okay? So that's that's why you know, this representation can also be really spelled out like this one here. It's just a much longer format to say exactly the same thing. Yep? Do we have to know the bottom? Hmm? Do we have to know the bottom? Do we have to? Know the bottom. Well, if it's in the module, yes, you have to know it. But the way you look at this is for every x in as an integer, for every y as an integer, y equals to 2x if and only if xy is an element of f. And it says exactly the same thing as this, except this is just a little bit more concise. Which then is also just expressing this with the constraint that x has to be an integer. So all of these are describing exactly the same thing. Do we have any questions before we proceed? So up to this point, okay, up to this point here, all we are really trying to say is the normal way that you look at a function, like in Calc 1 and some of your other math classes, we change that a little bit, which is not incompatible with what you already understand about functions. We just want to look at a function as a set of two tuples. The first item is where we're coming from. The second item in the two tuple is saying, okay, where are we going? And that's it. That's basically the main concept that we have introduced up to this point. Are we okay so far? Okay, yes, go ahead. I like questions. It still kind of feels like to me that we're using the thing to define the thing mm -hmm. in, this, in this last example. Um, we're using like it's a condition that it's a member of the function f, but it works kind of defining the function f, aren't we? Yes. So we are defining the function f or the set f, right? You know, f is a set. So basically, we are saying you know we want to define the set f where this is true. I think what he's asking is how do we know the right side is true if we haven't if we're using the function to define the function. Even this side here? 
Yeah. yeah. You do not because this is this whole thing is trying to define what M is, or the membership of M. But we're using the definition of M in its definition. No, we are we are not using the definition of F. We are defining F itself. Well, then at right hand side in the example it evaluated to false. So then, if the left hand side evaluates to false, then the right hand side also have to evaluate to false. So it it so that's why you know the if and only if is important because if one side is false, the other side has to be false. If one side is true, the other side has to be true. So when one side is true, it is acting as an includer, right? It is trying to say, oh, this better be an element of F. That's what it's trying to say. But if the left-hand side is false, it's acting as an excluder. It's saying, huh, if this side is false, that better not to be in F. In other words, this defines the membership of F. We are, I'm not trying to use F to define F. I'm using the notation to try to indicate how F should be defined. So the left side is the like the indicator of what's in F, yep. and then the right side is yep. just that's in F. That is correct. But it is important to use if and only if so that it can act both as an includer and also as an excluder. If it is an implication, then you, it is only an includer. It does not exclude things that should not be in, in the set F. That makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Why was negative 5? Um, right. If you got three out false, it's only false to be true. Does that mean then that that. that it's excluding it. Also, it's excluding it's it. Excluding it. Because in the early example, I'm, because this iterates through all the possible integers, right? And this also iterates through all the possible integers. So at some point, okay, you're going to go like, so at some point, x is going to be 3, and at some point, y is going to be negative 5. So what do we do when x is 3 and y is negative 5? Well, we just kind of go through the rest of the evaluation. Negative 5 equals to 2 times 3 is false. But because we are not really evaluating, we, are not, we don't know what f is at this point. But we want to make the if and only if true. So if this is false, then this better be false, which means um, 3, negative 5 as a 2 tuple should not be an element of f. So it is acting, so in that specific case, we are excluding the two tuple three negative five in parentheses as an element of f. So do we, we make it false because it has to be false? We, it is false because of this right. equality. Okay. Yep, go ahead. So the greater Um, so we are using that you know, property of if and only if, so that we can we are using it to define the membership of F, what belongs in F and what does not belong in F. Mm -hmm. So, so like the whole statement has to evaluate for true for any possible input, but it's also describing every possible input's relation to F. Right, there are multiple levels to what you just said because we are already using the filtering mechanism. So we are not even concerned about pi or the d constant and so on and so forth because they are not even integers. So we are already restricting x and y. They can only be integers. If they're not integers, we're not even considering it, right? But this thing, this entire thing has to be true um, when we define the membership of f. So we look at you know, the early example of 3 comma negative 5 in parentheses. We go like, oh, in that case, you know, this is false. So this has to be false too. So are we still doing OK so far with the statement? This is what I said a little bit earlier about you know, this is the application of how we use the quantifiers um, in the context of, in this case, you know, uh, looking at a set of two tuples as a function. Okay, those are all very good questions. Are there any other questions? Because coming up with the question in your mind 
is already an exercise because you're thinking, what about these conditions here? So that's good. But verbalizing the question is another step you know, because, you know, because in order to verbalize, you have to make connections to the concept, right? You, know, you have to name that thing. It's like, oh, that operator is, oh, this is if it only if and so on. So that's why asking questions or try to come up with questions is a good way to study the material. It's a good way to kind of reinforce all the pathways that you need to establish with this kind of material. So are there any other questions before we move on? All right, because the next section is a little bit interesting because it asks, what makes a function a function? Which is, it, it looks like a really dumb question. So what it really is asking is, what makes a set of two tuples a function, okay? But I just want to title it you know, as, what makes a function a function, just to make it kind of more catchy. Okay, so the first thing is, okay, this notation, remember this notation here? It is not a definition, it is a description. It is basically saying, okay, a function maps something from here to there, okay? It is simply asking, so what is, what are you talking about here? And what are you talking about there? That's all it is trying to describe. So once we know that f is a function that maps from set x to set y, then it automatically makes the following. It already, it automatically implies the following, which is f seen as a set has to be a subset of the Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain. Does that make sense to you? Because we are mapping from x to y. Every element of f as a two tuple is trying to map one thing in x to one thing in y. So is are we doing okay so far that this description automatically implies this statement to be true. Yep. So f is a set in this case of like all the... f is seen as a set, yes. Um, uh, to clarify, the set being like, for example, is it uh, an example you said about it's like 0, 0, 1, 2, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. It is a set of two tuples. But this also kind of definitely tells you that f has to be a set of two tuples because the Cartesian product between x and y is a set of two tuples, where for each element in the Cartesian product, in the two tuple, the first item of the two tuple comes from x, and the second item in the two tuple comes from y. Yes? Uh, I think I've used it with um, subset of. Could it not be equivalent? Nope, of it is not. <laughs> because of some additional constraints that we'll talk about. Okay. okay, so that's a very interesting question. The question is, instead of being subset of, you know, can you use equal to? And the answer is definitely not. Yeah, that was my next question. For example, if I, y, the example is about if y is like eight, and then x is like one, mm -hmm. you multiply them, it's gonna be one eight. So, so in some case, but, it, but the subset of still holds. It's just that in some other cases, the equality does not hold. So in that case, like equality wouldn't work with subset work with? In that specific case, yes. Okay. If x is an empty set and y is an empty set, the uh, equal to would still work because you know, the Cartesian product between an empty set and an empty set is an empty set. So the empty set being equal to the empty set is fine, okay? Because that's the only mapping you can get is when you try to map nothing to map to nothing. Go ahead. In, in this scenario, are we still defining x and y as all integers? This is general. This doesn't really care what x is or y or what y is. Yeah. So this one you know, has no restrictions whatsoever of what x is and what y is. They only have to be sets. They don't have to be the same. They can be the same, but they don't have to be. There's no restriction whatsoever in this case. The subset makes sense. Yep. Okay. All right. <clears throat> yep. Is there a person that they have those double points and those that arrow? Mm -hmm. What is the name of them? This one? Yeah, this arrow. I guess you can say maps to. Maps to. Yep. And what about those double points? The double. Double. Oh, 
the colon. I guess f such that the domain maps to the codomain. I mean, all we need to identify is the function that we are trying to describe. What is the domain and what is the codomain? So all this is describing is one, f is a function where x is the domain and y is the codomain. That's basically what this entire thing is saying. There's no equality whatsoever in this notation. Mm -hmm. All right. Are we still doing okay? All right. All right, so in addition to this observation being this one here, you know, F as a set is, the, is a subset of the Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain. There, there's another important criterion for a subset of the Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain to be a function. In English term, it says each element of the domain must map to, must be mapped to one and only one element in the codomain. Okay, so I'm gonna highlight this sentence in English and see if we understand what it means. I'm pretty sure we understand every single word of this, but what does it actually mean? Yes, go ahead. So why can we have one value for one, or sorry, why can only be one result for one value x? Why can f? Sorry, so like mm -hmm. when you're graphing, yeah. That is, that is correct, yep. I think I understand what you said, but I'm not sure about the rest of the class, so I'll use it as an example. Okay. But I, I think I know what you're talking about, so I will try to make sure that I cover that in the example of what is not a function. I'm not using a I think you got the right term. This is why we don't use English a lot in mathematical proof because it lacks the precision that we need. Yes, go ahead. Um, so that statement that you have highlighted, does that mean that, um, that not, not all elements of the codomain have to be included in the equation that someone can skip over? They may not be all u2x, okay, yes. But, this, but all of these examples are great because they, because they all illustrate the ambiguity that is actually built into a natural language. And that's why we have math mathematical notation, because math mathematical notation is not nearly as ambiguous. In fact, we want it to be totally not ambiguous, okay? But sometimes eh, we still have a little bit of ambiguity. Yep. Okay, so, so I think examples will help, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at a few examples, and then we'll ask a few questions, right? So what we'll do is we'll take a look at a few examples, okay? Use the vertical bar here. <clears throat> the first one is I'm going to define x as uh, 1 and 2, okay? We'll, we'll keep it simple. Y is um, A and B. So this way it's pretty clear when you look at, you know, you know what maps to what. what. And we're going to define, you know, f is, um, well, we'll, we'll, we'll just use an empty set right now, okay? Because, you know, the empty set, you know, represents a boundary case. And we're trying to evaluate the highlighted statement here. So when f is defined to be an empty set, the, the domain is 1, 2, and y is a, b, is this statement true? Each element of the domain must be mapped to one and only one element in the code domain. Is that statement true? No, obviously not, because nothing is mapped, right? One is not mapped to anything, two is not mapped to anything, so I cannot say that each element of the domain maps to blah, blah, blah. Okay, there's no mapping whatsoever. Okay, so that means in this case, f is not a function. Or I can say, okay, so I can now say f okay 
Are we good? Because you know, f is not, being the empty set, is not a function that maps from one, two as the domain to a, b as a codomain. Okay. Is that okay? So next we'll look at something that's uh, not quite as bad. Okay. This is why I like di, because it's easy to do something like this. Okay. So we'll use 1a and 2b. Okay. <clears throat> what about this? So let me you know, uh, go to the end here and get rid of the conclusion because we don't know yet. Okay. What about the second example where the domain is 1, 2, the codomain is A, B, and the mapping is let's map 1 to A and 2 to B. Does that satisfy the highlighted statement that for each element in the domain, each element of the domain is mapped to one and only one element in the codomain? It's good. Okay. All right. So now let's try to. Uh, so this is true. Okay. So we'll answer the question. Okay. So we'll look at another case here. And this time we modified it just a little bit, and I get rid of the answer here, so that we can try to figure out what the answer is. So it looks almost the same as before. The domain is one two. The codomain is A, B, but the mapping is changed just a little bit. One maps to A, two also maps to A. So the question is, is the highlighted statement still true? Each element of the domain must be mapped to one and only one element in the codomain. Is that still true? I, I hate to turn this into an English class, but the answer is it is still true. Because the, the word unique is not here. I only said one and only one. What, what does it mean by one and only one? It means at least one, at the most one. That mean, that's what it means when he says when I say one and only one. So is A an element of the codomain? Yes. Am I mapping to, to only one element in the codomain? Yes. Am I mapping to, to at most one element in the codomain? Yes. So if it meets the requirement of at least one and at most one, then it meets the requirement of one and only one. I'll show those examples. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll get to those. So this is still okay, okay? Because one and only one does not say anything about uniqueness. Okay? So we'll, we'll deal with uniqueness when we get to the next module that talks about injection and surjection. But the, this module does not talk about uniqueness, okay? Okay, so, so far so good. And we'll look at yet another example. And this time I switched that a little bit. So 1A, 1B, okay, are the elements. So the first question, okay, so let's go, let's roll all the way back. Is, oh, you guys cannot see the, the rendering. Let me go here. And I want to get rid of the answer because we, that's what we are trying to figure out. There we go. All right, so is this still a subset of the Cartesian product between the set uh, X and the set Y. No. Yes. 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 Who said no? <laughs> because if you said no, that then you have to tell me which one of these is not supposed to be in the Cartesian product. Which one is not in the Cartesian product? They are both in the Cartesian product. Because the Cartesian product consists of the set of two tuples where the first item of each two tuple has to come from the left-hand side of the Cartesian operator, Cartesian product operator. The second item has to come from the right-hand side of the Cartesian product operator, right? Does one come from X? Does one come from X? Oh, I just asked that question earlier. Yes, okay. Does B 
does A come from Y? Does A come from Y? Yes. Does B come from Y? Yes. So it meets all the requirements. It is a subset of the Cartesian product. Because if it's not a subset of the Cartesian product, we can answer the question with false right, right away. Okay. But now the question is, are we also satisfying each element of the domain must be mapped to one and only one element in the codomain? The answer is no twice. <laughs> okay, let me explain why it is no twice. Okay, so we, we look at each element of the domain first. Okay, how many elements do we have in the domain? We have two elements in the domain. So we focus on, say, one first. Okay, and then you ask the question, is it mapped to, at the most, and at the least, one element in the codomain? Uh, no, because one maps to A and one maps to B. It maps to not one and only one element in the codomain. Is that okay? And because this whole thing says each element, so if one element is failing that requirement, the whole thing is going to fail anyway. But let's make it fail again, okay? Because there's another way to fail this. Is uh, what about two? Two is an element of the domain, right? So that means we can potentially evaluate must be mapped to one and only one element in the codomain. Uh, can you guys tell me how many elements in the codomain is mapped from two? Zero, okay, very good. Is zero at least one? No. So it has failed that requirement too. So that means the we. That means element one fails the requirement, element two also fails the requirement. Is that okay? This set is so bad as a non-function that we have multiple reasons to say that it is not a function, okay? So now we say well, <clears throat> is false, okay? I'll give you, you know, like, maybe two more examples, just to be sure that we know what, how we define this thing. We go like, okay, what about this? What about uh, we, we, we make sure that two is also mapped to something, okay? What about this? Oh, you guys cannot see the rendering. Give me a second, let me show here. There we go, so read this portion. We still have the same domain and the same, same codomain, and this time I have three elements in F. Is it still a subset of the Cartesian product between X and Y? Yes, okay. Um, so we look at each element of the domain and we ask, okay, let's look at one. Um, oh, we have the same problem as last time. One is mapped to both A and B, so one and only one is not satisfied because it's mapping to two. Is that okay? But when you look at two, it is actually okay this time because two maps to, well, exactly just one of the two elements in the codomain, it's fine. But is this still a function? It's not a function. It fails one of the two requirements or at least one element fails the requirement, the whole thing is not a function anymore. Are we doing okay so far with you know, what makes a function a function and what makes a function not a function? Um, what makes, I take it back. What makes a set of two tuples not a function? Okay, that's more like it. Are we still doing okay? So <clears throat> let me ask you this question. Um, okay, so this is the question. And I, I still want to take row here, you know, so I'm going to ask the question and then we'll go back and take row. Okay, so I'll ask you list all the subsets of, and I'll make it very clear what subset we are talking about. Um, it's related to exactly what we were talking about, but I just want to know how many subsets are there. Okay, I'm not concerned about which one is a function and which one is not a function. I just want to know what are the subsets, okay? Sorry? <laughs> uh, we, I, I'm fairly sure it's not four, okay? Because we have seen how many already? 
uh, here's one, two, three, four, and five. We have seen five subsets already. Okay, does, does anyone want to give me an answer or do you guys just want a little bit more time to think about it first? It is not infinite, yep. Is there only one subset for each um, we don't care about whether it's a function or not. So whether it's a function is not even a, is not even on the table. I just want to know what are the subsets of the Cartesian product between one two on one side and A B on the other side. Okay, so we'll we'll get, come back and talk about this. Okay, but I'm gonna take row first. I have to adjust a few things because it's already uh, kind of past the uh, the time that I have set up. So give me a second here so I can. It does that first. All right, so we'll put this to, uh, let's just make it 420. That should be enough time. Give me a second. And let's go 430 here. 20. go. The pass, the access code is Optimus. I cannot remember exactly why, but I think I was talking about prime numbers. Optimus, Brian. <laughs> when my neighbor's kid, you know, went, uh, you know, came home, you know, to his mom and showed your mom the new toy that he, that he just got, which is an Optimus, Optimus Prime, you know, uh, toy. And his dad, who is significantly younger than I am, was actually surprised that I know what Optimus Prime was. I go like, yeah, because, you know, Autobots, I mean, uh, Transformers, you know, originated in the 80s. <laughs> of course I know what it is. You guys are, re you guys are watching remakes of the same thing. I watched the original. <laughs> and I think it's still the same voice actor for Optimus Prime, even in all the movies, which is actually you know, impressive. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, because he just has that voice that is really hard to replicate. Autobots transformed and rolled out. I can't really quite do the impersonation because it's it's hard. You know, it, he just has that quality to it. All right. So if, if this is all done, let's go back to the uh, example here. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys a clue. Okay. The clue is I will give you a systematic way of looking at the subsets, okay? So I'm gonna use, oh, I need dollar signs, right? Okay, is that a subset of the Cartesian product? Okay, what about uh, just that? Yep, okay, and there are four of these, right? Oh, we got a close brand here. That is also a subset, right? Now, it, it's not a function, okay? But once again, we are not, we don't care whether it's a function or not. So now, the question is, how many of the subsets only have two elements in it? Four, that is correct, very good. What about the number of subsets that have, that have the number of subsets that each has two elements in it. Okay, so maybe it helps to basically just look at the Cartesian product as a set that has uh, W, X, Y, Z, okay, as elements. So because you know, the two, whether they, they are two tuples or not really does not matter. 
what matters is there are four elements in the Cartesian product. The answer to that question is two to the power of four. You go like, why? Why is it two to the power of four? Because every element can either be present or absent in the subset. Okay, so let, let's, let's digest that one statement first, okay? Each element of the original set, which in this case is the Cartesian product, can either be in or not in the subset itself. So that means for each element, we have two choices. But the choice for each element does not automatically determine the choices of the other elements. Is that okay? Okay, think about the tree, okay? How many people know what a tree is in computer science? Okay, a few, okay, go ahead. If you have all four not be in it, aren't you replicating an empty set? That's only a one method. And we're like two, aren't you counting an empty set twice? Or nope, you will set? only count it once. So the empty set will only be counted once. The entire set will also be only counted once. Okay, let oh, me, I what you're saying. Yeah. okay, so, let me, let me do this in a slightly different way, okay? So I will retract this, okay? And we'll say, um, one A is in uh, the subset, okay? So we'll say, you know, in the subset, I cannot, is in, okay? We'll just say is in, okay? And then the other choice is, it is not in. Is that okay? But just because if one A is in or not, does not say anything about one B. So now I can say, oh, oh, I forgot the parent here. One B, oops, ah, is in, one B is not in. And let me fix the notation because I do not want you guys to use the wrong notation. It is important to use the right notation. Okay, uh, let me make sure this rolls all the way down so that we can see it. Is that, is that making any sense to you? How it is all nested? So if I just want to consider one A first, okay? There's no particular reason why I want to consider that one first, but let's just say that we do. So one A as an element may be in the subset, or it may not be in the subset. But while one A is in the subset, one B can choose, I want to be in or I want to be out. But when one A is not in, then one B also has those, those two choices. So at this point, we have four possible ways. Is that okay? Are we, guys, are we starting to see the pattern? Okay, so now, when we look at the case when one A is in, one B is also in, but this time we want to look at one C, uh, excuse me, two A. So now we look at this, okay, let me, I'm using the DI keystrokes here. Nope, two A, two, two A is in or two A is out. Is that okay? But I can also apply this to here, to here, as well as to here. Okay, so if you count the number of items at the third level of nesting, how many items do we have now? There are eight now, right? Because I've only considered three of the four possible elements. So when I consider the very last, the fourth of the four elements, what do you think the what do you think will be the number of elements at the fourth nested level of this nested list? Sixteen. That's right. So I have just drawn a tree, not as a picture, but as a nested list. So that's why there are sixteen subsets, when the original set only has four items. So the next question you might want to think about is. Of those 16 subsets, how many are possible functions? Okay.
okay? It's not a homework assignment, okay? Just think about it, okay? Write down the question and gnaw on it, okay? You know, I use that word a lot, G-N-A-W, gnaw, okay? Because, you know, that's, that's how I process things, okay? You know, my, I'm not quick, okay? I'm not really smart. I need to gnaw on things or slow cook you know, ideas and concepts, but that means it has to be on my mind, like I have to remind myself what I need to think about, but I need time to absorb those concepts. Okay. So on Wednesday, when we come back, um, we'll, we'll talk about this. Okay. We'll talk about how many of those 16 subsets are actually functions. Okay. All right. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And don't forget about the homework assignment. Do you have any stop the recorder?